Professor, and welcome to Games as Lit 101. Recently, as a reward for reaching a certain goal on my Patreon, I allowed you, my viewers, to choose by vote which terrible game I would analyze out of a pool that I selected. I expected some of the classic ones. Sonic 06, Ride to Hell, Retribution, Drake of the 99 Dragons, just classic, hilariously terrible stuff. Instead, you gave me Metroid Other M. I really hope you appreciate what I do for you guys. Metroid is a classic Nintendo franchise that began in 1986 on the original Nintendo Entertainment System. The first game is a side-scrolling sci-fi action platformer where you play as Samus Aran, a bounty hunter exploring the planet Zebes in order to stop space pirates from weaponizing dangerous parasitic life forms called Metroids. The game made a particular splash because once you got through the game, Samus takes off her helmet to reveal that she's a woman. The vast majority of games at the time, especially in this genre, starred men, which admittedly has only gotten a little better over time, so learning that this awesome, powerful space warrior we'd been playing was actually a woman was quite surprising and made a major impact. As you might expect, this gave Samus a major place in video game history as one of the earliest action girls of this medium. In fact, she's the second earliest female protagonist in video games whose games are still being made today, right behind Mrs. Pac-Man in first place. Now, as a feminist icon, she wasn't entirely perfect, notably in that she was still sexualized by images earned at the end of some of the games, which became increasingly sexualized based on criteria like completion time and percentage of extra items you acquired. And since storytelling was a little priority at the time, she wasn't really developed as a character much. But at the time, the simple presence of a woman standing among classic video game heroes was a special thing, and the way it was presented as a surprise at the end made a clear statement that her gender had nothing to do with her ability to be an awesome video game action hero. So in 2010, Nintendo decided it was time to develop Samus' character further by giving her a voice and a more developed personality. To this end, Yoshio Sakamoto, co-creator of the Metroid series, enlisted the help of Team Ninja, the developing team responsible for bringing Ninja Gaiden into 3D gaming and for creating the Dead or Alive series. Yeah. So, just to make sure that this is well understood. The task of giving character development to one of gaming's oldest and most beloved female protagonists was given to the creators of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball. The inventors of video game breast physics. The grand master of pandering to desperate, horny teenage boys. <sighs> this is gonna suck, isn't it? Sakamoto himself took up the challenge of writing the story, so Team Ninja can't be fully or honestly probably even mostly blamed for the disaster that followed. Apparently Sakamoto even told them to tone it down a bit, which, thank god for that, it, it could have been so much worse, but regardless, I still maintain that the creators of Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball should probably not have been let anywhere near Samus in the first place. But believe it or not, that wasn't this game's biggest problem. Not by a long shot. We'll talk more about that as I go over the story, and then after that, I'll try and bring it all together by talking about what the game tries to mean, why it fails rather spectacularly at actually meaning any of it, and how it ends up horribly misrepresenting one of the most important female figures in video games. As always, this is a full analysis of the game's story, so all of the spoilers are ahead of us for Metroid Other M, as well as some major spoilers for Super Metroid, and some minor spoilers for some of the other games in the series. So if you want the full experience of the game, I recommend you play it for yourself before watching this video. That said, I am analyzing this game specifically because it's not good, so I'm not going to pressure you as much as I normally do. Just be aware, spoilers. First though, some background. Metroid Fusion included some written memoirs of Samus, which told a story about a commanding officer named Adam Malkovich, who she served under in the Federation before she became a bounty hunter, and who she respects greatly. She named the AI in Fusion after him, and the game had some pretty good moments between them. So Other M decided to tell the story of Adam and Samus. Before the story proper begins, we get a narrated flashback to the end of Super Metroid, wherein a baby Metroid who attached itself to Samus at hatching saved her life at the cost of its own. This left a psychological impact on Samus, and she talks about it a lot. Once we get past this prologue, Samus gets a distress call from a dormant vessel called a bottle ship. Upon getting there, she encounters a Federation group led by her former commander, Adam Malkovich. At this point, we get a whole ton of backstory in one of this game's many, many expository cutscenes. Alright, so we've gotten glimpses before, but this is going to be our first particularly detailed look at Samus' personality and backstory. That's pretty awesome. So, let's see how one of gaming's most badass women fares, shall we? 
Any objections, lady? The thumbs up sign had been used by the Galactic Federation for ages. Me? I was known for giving the thumbs down during briefing. It touched me on some level that Adam would acknowledge that past by calling me something delicate, like Lady. I was a child, always with something to prove, a chip on my shoulder. When I rebelled against him, I knew I could get away with it. And his paternal compassion in the face of my rebellion reinforced the special bond I felt with him. I understood well that chances were slim that I would ever find anyone that understood me like Adam. And yet, when the time came, I still left his side. I was so young. Young and naive. Okay. Okay, let's just... Let me... All right, can, can we just... Uh, okay, let me just try and explain what is already so wrong with all of this. Let's acknowledge that Samus was a silent protagonist before this game. There were actually a few bits of dialogue written into a, some of her older games, but point is, she was not a particularly developed character. But that doesn't mean that she was a completely blank slate. She does have a character and a personality, and it's pretty easy to figure out a lot of the basics just by looking at the previous games in the series. She spends the vast majority of the series, that is, all but a few instances in the Metroid Prime trilogy, alone. Well, alone, she explores ancient ruins, faces off against wildly dangerous feral creatures, and basically saves the known universe multiple times by battling some of the most dangerous creatures known to man and squaring off against nefarious space pirates. We know that her parents were killed by a dragon-like villain of the series named Ridley, and Samus was raised by the Chozo, a race of aliens who infused her with their DNA and granted her the power suit so she could become a powerful warrior. Samus parted ways with them eventually to become a soldier in the Federation, but later left to become a bounty hunter. So we don't exactly have a detailed personality profile on her, but we can figure out plenty of basic things about her character. She's very powerful and capable of handling herself perfectly well, to such a degree that she's repeatedly destroyed major space pirate operations, solved a major crisis regarding a dangerous, sentient substance called Phazon, and even managed to destroy an entire planet. She's courageous and persistent, even in the face of seemingly impossible odds. She seems to, for one reason or another, prefer working alone, be it out of distrust for authority, dislike for working under strict regulations, or simply being an introvert. Who knows? In one game, she chooses to destroy a dangerous parasite against the mission parameters rather than letting the Federation attempt experimentation on it. Basically, she's a brave, confident, persistent, and highly skilled warrior who calls her own shots and does what needs to be done. She rebels when she thinks it necessary, and while she accepts help from others, she doesn't generally like to depend on others for direction. So what does Other M have to say so far? And yet, when the time came, I still left his side. I was so young. Young and naive. So basically, she used to be fairly similar to how we determined the character probably is from previous games. But that's because she was young, naive, and stupid. And now she just wants to please Adam, who's kind of staring at her a little creepily. Oh, who am I kidding? Metroid's nothing like Twilight. I'm sure this game won't end up romanticizing a poorly written and clearly abusive relationship while depriving its female lead of any charisma, intelligence, or agency. So Samus goes off to turn on a generator or something. In all fairness, this kind of objective-based gameplay with only so much story significance is fairly typical for the series, and it's here that we're introduced to one of the most infamous elements of this game, Adam's Authorization. Some basic background information for those who aren't too familiar with Metroid. With the exception of a few tutorial sequences in some games, the Metroid series generally starts off with Samus not having many abilities and not being very powerful. You gain more of these abilities slowly over the course of the game. This is, of course, primarily for gameplay purposes. In the cases where it has a tutorial, it makes it rather exciting. It ends up granting the player more power as the game progresses, and the acquisition of specific abilities allows the player to access previously inaccessible areas and items. 
This structure is part of the basic framework of a genre known as Metroidvania, due to Metroid's part in its creation along with the Castlevania series. Now, generally, new abilities in Metroid are gained through Chozo artifacts, rooms that have the necessary equipment, or simply gained by defeating powerful enemies. This works perfectly well, but does sometimes suffer from obvious game logic. Works for the gameplay, but doesn't necessarily make all that much sense when you really think about it. In writing the story of Other M, Yoshio Sakamoto wanted to provide an in-story reason for Samus to be gaining these abilities as she goes through the story, thus fixing that minor ludonarrative consistency issue. So what does Other M do? Looks like I'm gonna need to ask for your cooperation on this mission, but I'm also gonna have to ask that you follow my commands. You don't move unless I say so, and you don't fire until I say so. Yeah. Samus can't use any of her equipment until she's given permission. She has all of it, available and ready to use at any time, but she will refuse to until given authorization by a man who has no actual authority over her in this situation whatsoever. This is stupid. The cherry on top is that this takes effect even before Adam actually gives Samus this ultimatum. The gameplay prior to that cutscene doesn't allow Samus to use Morph Ball Bombs due to the fact that Adam hasn't authorized their use yet. Thinking about this narratively, this means that Samus is refusing to use equipment Adam hasn't authorized even before he expresses his order to control how she uses that equipment. Admittedly, that particular point's a little nitpicky. That's a pretty minor narrative and gameplay inconsistency, but that's the whole problem with this idea. It exists specifically to join gameplay and narrative together, to give a reason in the story for a central gameplay mechanic, but the reason it gives doesn't make all that much sense, and to make it worse, manages to speak pretty poorly to Samus as a character. Remember the personality traits that we identified a bit ago based on all the games that came before this one? Based on that, do you think that Samus is really the kind of woman who would so easily and willingly give up control over her own actions like this? Now, to be fair, Adam does have a good reason for restricting one of Samus's abilities in particular. The power bomb is actually strong enough that it could cause legitimate structural damage to the space station, and, you know, when you're floating around in the vacuum of space, you don't really want to cause damage to the vessel you're in, so that's perfectly understandable. But None of her other abilities have that same level of destructive power, and for that matter, she has a number of other abilities that aren't destructive whatsoever, like protective suit features and a grapple beam, so it's still just really, really stupid. But don't worry, it gets worse. While exploring the ship, Samus comes across this adorable little thing before- holy crap, it's- okay, you know what? No, it's still adorable. I want one. Look at its cute little fur and it, its bloody teeth. <clears throat> anyway, Samus has a brief monologue about it. Some creatures use the powers of others to capture their prey. Watching this disgusting beast, I felt as though it was feeding off my power as well. And I get the impression that it's supposed to be important, but... I, I mean, what is the point, really? What, she's disgusted by scavengers? Something about taking from someone else's success rather than working out for your own, perhaps? This seems kind of out of place from the rest of the story, but I guess we'll see. Eventually, the team discovers that the bottle ship was housing the experimentation and creation of bioweapons. This is illegal, and Samus notes that Adam is strongly against their development and use. Not only was he a strong opponent of bioweapons, he was against the use of living things for unnecessary reasons, period. She doesn't really have anything to say for herself on the matter, apparently. Also, this happens. Back. I want all the soldiers to evacuate this area. Samus, your orders are to take care of all enemy targets. Samus! So a dangerous situation comes up, all the soldiers are there, and Adam orders Samus to face the danger completely alone. For some reason. And she immediately complies, shutting off the soldiers who are all too willing to help her not die. Well, whatever. I'm sure Adam won't be ordering Samus to do more stupid, dangerous things for no reason whatsoever throughout this game. A crazy, formidable creature suddenly attacks everyone for some reason, and yes, that's a summary of almost every major battle in this game, and ends up killing one of the soldiers. Samus finds the husk of that adorable little creature from before, as it would appear it was just a larval form of the thing that attacked them. Adam orders her to go follow it, and she obeys. She then ends up finding herself in a fairly traditional situation for a Metroid game, a hell run. 
rushing through an area with extreme conditions that make her health go down continually. The player has to rush through the area at first, since if they stay in it too long, they'll die, and then they'll eventually find a suit upgrade, usually called the Varia suit, that will better protect Samus from the extreme environment so she doesn't need to rush around in it anymore. So while searching for the Varia suit upgrade, Samus- Samus, activate the Varia feature on your suit to protect yourself from heat damage. Okay, no, this has officially gotten- <sighs> Okay, no, I should- I should take a moment to talk about how narrative and gameplay collide in this instance. So, in almost every video game ever made, there is some level of separation between gameplay and story, some difference in how they work. Now, it could be pretty minor, like not dying after taking a few bullets, or the fact that you can't actually make a grenade out of gunpowder and scissor blades. Or it could be more serious, like the death of a character in a game where you can revive them if they die in battle. In the vast majority of cases, gameplay can't emulate life exactly. Maybe the subject is too complex, or maybe realism in the gameplay would just make it too boring or too frustrating. So there is an extent to which these inconsistencies are to be expected and should be easily forgiven. But when a game does what Other M is doing here, it's for the express purpose of eliminating those inconsistencies. It's essentially tying the mechanics into the narrative, and in doing so, granting them the same level of narrative meaning as any other element of the story. And normally, that's a really good thing for a game to do. But the meaning it creates in this case is nothing short of abhorrent. This game decided to make Varia a feature of the suit rather than an upgrade to it, which means that Samus always had this ability. All she had to do was activate it. So when Samus went into an area that was literally killing her, Adam withheld authorization to use a feature on her suit that would significantly increase her chance of living through it. For no reason whatsoever. Obviously, the game just wanted to provide the hell run, so it's entirely possible, and I genuinely hope this is the explanation, that this was just lazy writing, and Sakamoto didn't really realize the implications of this gameplay segment when paired with the fact that Adam could simply have authorized use of her suit to save her the pain and great potential for death. But Adam is starting to look a lot more abusive than benevolent at this point. But wait! There's more! A small but incredibly annoying little detail is that the only reasoning we've gotten so far for Adam's restricting Samus's abilities is the potential destruction and casualties they could cause. We already talked about how that's some pretty flimsy reasoning, with everything except the power bomb, but to make it even worse, the Varia feature has no destructive capabilities. None whatsoever. According to Adam's reasoning, and just any logical reasoning, there's no reason he should have restricted it from Samus in the first place. Literally, the only thing it does is help her not die. And that's only talking about what's wrong with Adam in this scenario. We've already talked about how Samus's unquestioning obedience to Adam is kind of out of character for her, but this situation is so much worse. She was literally dying, and had exactly what she needed to save herself the entire time, and didn't activate it just because Adam had not yet given her his explicit permission. She didn't even question it. She could have at least just radioed him like, Hey Adam, can I activate the Varia feature now so I don't burn to death in my suit? But no, nothing like that whatsoever. She just went with it. That is seriously not in line with what we know of Samus's character, and quite frankly, it's developing her as a stupid and unrelatable person. Now, you could try to excuse this away, say that I'm reading too far into the mechanics and I need to just let these little inconsistencies slide. Problem is, this game went out of its way to make sure that I couldn't do that. It tells its story almost entirely through its cutscenes, but this is the one way it meshes its narrative with its gameplay. It actively tied its upgrade mechanic to Adam's character and his decisions. Video games are best understood as a single work anyway, not just as gameplay glued to a story, but even if I wanted to look at it that way, Other M has made it clear that it doesn't want me to. It wants me to understand its mechanics in the context of its story, which means I would quite simply just be incorrect to try and consider them distinct from one another. Adam's always had some creepy undertones, but this, this is entirely too much. This is active malevolence. I can see no possible explanation, no justification for his actions in this instance, or for Samus's willingness to go along with them. At this point, the only thing that could save this story is for it to eventually be revealed that Adam is kind of abusive, and to turn him into an antagonist, and have Samus get out from under his thumb. Spoilers. That doesn't happen. 
Soon afterwards, Samus comes across a woman named Madeline Bergman, previously referenced as the brains behind the bioweapon experimentation. We find out that this ship was basically being turned into a replica of the planet Zebes, the Metroid homeworld that Samus destroyed in the chronologically previous game, and that's why there are so many familiar creatures aboard the ship. But Madeline doesn't trust Samus, because she saw one of the Federation soldiers shoot another in the back earlier. This inspires Samus to figure out a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, I think she might just be making up. At this rate, the plan the Federation wanted to keep so secret would be revealed. So they sent in an assassin. Someone to wipe out any survivors as well as anyone who learned about the secret project. KG, James, Anthony, and Adam. Could one of them really be a traitor? Until I found out who it was, I decided to call the traitor the deleter. There's no way to get all that information out of the fact that a soldier just shot another in the back, but alright, we'll go with her theory for now. Also, seriously, the deleter? That's what you're calling your traitor? Deleter? I'm just gonna chalk that one up to bad translation, but still, seriously. In any case, some kind of treachery is confirmed when a loader manned by one of the Federation soldiers attacks Samus. A loader that has a lot of weaponry on it for some reason, I guess. I don't... okay, whatever. Madeline runs away and Samus doesn't know where she is. She runs into Anthony again soon afterward and we get another flashback. Apparently the reason Samus left the Federation army was a decision Adam made to leave his brother to die, claiming there was no time to save him. Adam, wait! There's still time! I can make it! Please, let me go. I mean... That's Ian! That's your little brother out there! Now, I'm not sure the girl who constantly gave Adam the thumbs down would beg to him like that and follow orders regardless, but I can actually buy this as a backstory. The idea that she would become disillusioned with authority and with taking orders after a questionable decision like that, and she would leave the Federation in order to become a bounty hunter and live by no one's rules but her own. Except that she's not like that at all in this game, and in fact, if anything, is more submissive to Adam in the events of Other M than she was in that cutscene, so it's still just really inconsistent. We also get this bit. Did something like that happen now? Huh. Best just forget about it. I'm out. I knew the question Anthony was suppressing, and I knew the answer. If something like that happened again, I would hold fast to that glimmer of hope and try for redemption. That's who I am. I have no idea what that means. I've seen politicians answer questions more directly than that. Is she saying that she would hold on to hope that she could take care of the situation and that she would redeem herself by acting on her conscience regardless of what Adam says? Or, or is she saying that she should never have challenged him and she would hold on to hope that he's making the right decision and just stay quiet like a good little girl? I was childish. No one should have to make the choice that Adam did. And yet all I could do was question his authority and make things more difficult. Oh. Well, I guess that answers that then. The whole game seems to have a tension between the Samus that previous games have shown us and this really submissive, dependent version of Samus Other M is trying to sell us. It's basically showing us a younger, more brash version of the character that has some attitude and independence that we would expect from Samus, but rather than showing how those characteristics have been refined into a strong, independent warrior, it demonizes that younger version of herself as childish and spends the whole game telling us why she should really just unquestionably submit to Adam. It's like it wasn't happy just mischaracterizing Samus, it had to show us elements of what we expected her to be like, then actively denounce them in favor of making her emotional and submissive about everything. And don't worry, we'll talk about the sexism problems with that later. And now, now we come to one of the more blatantly problematic things that happens in this game. Now, uh, I know that so far this video has mostly been me just talking about plot point to stupid plot point to stupid problematic plot point it all comes together. We're, we're going somewhere with this, I promise, but... In the, okay. Most of the problems so far have required some level of interpretation or reading between the lines to really understand why they're problematic in the first place. This one doesn't. It's just stupid. Samus encounters Ridley, a classic enemy from the series, and this happens.
Samus. You copy. Samus! Samus, use your plasma beam! What's your status? Samus, do you read me? Okay, so remember that Ridley killed Samus's parents. Never mind that this was established in a manga that was never actually officially translated into English, and that that fact was never established in this game itself, but that's what happened. So, sure, Samus is confronted with the creature that she, as a child, saw murdering her parents, and she freezes up. That's legitimate. This shot of her literally regressing into a little girl in front of him is actually a really beautiful shot. That's good stuff. At least it would be, had she not defeated him at least once in four other Metroid games preceding this one chronologically. Yeah. Some of them were weird versions of him, and even this one's a clone, since he was apparently killed for good in Super Metroid, but... Yeah, she's fought him. A whole lot of times. And defeated him. Without issue. And yet, despite having defeated him at least five times by my count, the minute he shows up here, she freezes completely and ends up getting her friend Anthony killed by her inaction. To top it off, even after she recovers, she doesn't actually kill Ridley, nor does she ever get another chance to in this game. At this point, it's very clear that Other M is characterizing Samus as significantly less strong and competent than she had been in previous games. Now, I doubt that that was Sakamoto's intent. In all likelihood, he was probably just trying to characterize her and give her an interesting personality and character flaws and just failed miserably. But regardless, this is probably the biggest and most blatant characterization mishap of Samus so far in this game. I understand trying to make a character moment out of this. I understand addressing the fact that she saw this creature kill her parents. I understand trying to let her be more weak and vulnerable than she's been in previous games. But this is too much, and it's poorly timed. I could accept this if it was the first time she'd faced Ridley since the death of her parents, but the only reason his appearance should be abnormal in the slightest is because she killed him in Super Metroid. Except that this is also far from the first time she seems to have killed him anyway. All this comes together to make Samus look weak and incompetent, and again, there's not a problem with a character having flaws. A character without flaws is quite simply a bad character, but the flaws need to be consistent, and Samus is not weak or incompetent. This is not Samus. After the battle is the best part of the game. Adam ceases contact. With no explanation, no warning, just gone, and Samus is unsure about the whole situation. Now obviously this is a very crappy move on his part, and no, we don't really get an explanation as to why he disappeared suddenly without telling Samus, but we do at least get to see Samus act on her own for once. Any objections, Adam? Unfortunately, this is only really because Adam's no longer around to tell her what to do, and she takes advantage of that situation to activate the Space Jump and Screw Attack, two things that have far more practical purposes for exploration and maneuvering than for destruction in the first place. And thus, didn't really make much sense for Adam to restrict at all. The simple fact that this kind of independent initiative is abnormal for Samus in this game makes it a little hard to appreciate it when it does show up. She sees a Federation soldier and suspects him to be the deleter. She doesn't catch up to him because the game makes us walk really, really, slowly. But she ends up running into Madeline Bergman again and manages to have a civilized discussion with her. Turns out that their attempt to recreate Zeebs' ecosystem, and no, I don't know how to pronounce that planet's name, but this game can't seem to decide either, so I'm just gonna call it Zeebs, started turning into a full-blown resurrection of the Zeebsian space pirates. So the Federation was trying to erase the experiments and everyone who knew about them. Turns out they not only recreated and experimented on Metroids, but even made an artificial intelligence based on Mother Brain to control them. Which is a stupid idea on a number of levels, but I'll just ignore that. So Samus figures they must want to save the Metroids contained in Sector Zero of the ship, so they could continue bioweapon experimentation on them. Samus exposits that this is why they sent a deleter, ugh, instead of just blowing up the station from a distance, to save the Metroids and AI while eliminating everyone else who knew about the project. She still makes a good few logical leaps to actually realize all of these things, but... Whatever, that's a minor problem at this point. Samus decides to go check out Sector Zero, and we see that soldier approach Madeline, and a shot rings out. <laughs> Meanwhile, Samus ends up running into a little baby Metroid. She has flashbacks to the baby Metroid that saved her life in Super Metroid, and understandably hesitates to immediately kill this one. 
then this happens. This scene is really long, so I'll just summarize the basics. Adam shot Samus because he found out the Metroids in Sector Zero have been altered to be immune to freezing, historically the thing's only weakness, and the Sector would have to be separated from the ship and self-destructed in order to destroy them. To make matters worse, the AI has set the station on a course for Federation HQ, and if these Metroids are still there and still alive when it gets there, or even if they're safely extracted and experimentation continues on them, the galaxy is basically screwed. Adam didn't want Samus to go into Sector Zero and make that sacrifice, so he took her out of commission so she wouldn't defy him and do it herself. Now on the surface, this is a heroic sacrifice, and it's very clear that the game wants us to interpret it that way. That's how it's presented. But when we actually start looking into it, it becomes quite possibly the most disturbing event of Samus and Adam's relationship in this entire game. I mean, think about this series of events. Samus encounters a Metroid, one of the most dangerous creatures in the known universe, and Adam, seeing her with it, shoots Samus in the back. This makes Samus's armor disappear. We won't get into how her armor manifests here, but it sort of makes sense. Then Adam shoots the Metroid as well. So thus far, Adam, a man who Samus trusts and respects to the point of refusing to turn on a life-saving feature of her suit despite her pain and danger until he says that she's allowed to, sees Samus with one of the most dangerous creatures in the known galaxy, and when Adam comes across this scene, he shoots Samus in the back. And as she's left there, writhing in pain and vulnerable to said dangerous creature, he waits 44 seconds, yes, I counted, 44 seconds of a Metroid hovering around a vulnerable Samus to shoot it. Say what you will about his motives, but it's obvious that this is very painful and humiliating for Samus. And since he was within shooting range, he must simply have been standing by, leaving her vulnerable in the presence of immense danger until the very last second. There's no good reason he couldn't have shot the Metroid first, so as not to put Samus's life in danger. But it gets worse. So why did you shoot me? Now that's a genuinely good question. Because there's no reason for him to have done that. Samus has obeyed Adam's every order over the course of this game without questioning, even when those orders put her through pain and in unnecessary danger for completely arbitrary reasons. There is no reason whatsoever that Adam would feel the need to incapacitate Samus in order to make her do what he wants. But instead of just giving her another order, instead of even considering that he could have a reasonable discussion with her, or respecting her enough to expect her to understand his actions, he causes her great pain, humiliation, and fear. 
Obviously, the game was trying to set up the possibility that Adam was the deleter, but much like the Hell Run, the implications of this scene playing out the way it does are genuinely disturbing. Adam purposefully chose to take away Samus's agency in an unnecessary and downright abusive way, and even to stand by for no reason while she was threatened by a dangerous creature. And none of it was necessary. The scene plays up Adam's sacrifice, but it's hard to see his actions as benevolent towards Samus after how he's treated her. It comes across like it's more likely that he's giving his life for the good of the Federation, not out of care for Samus, or maybe even as a final show of control over her. And the fact is, even if this is a selfless sacrifice for Samus's sake, it's hard to accept that considering what he has just done to her and how he's treated her. And it certainly doesn't justify that treatment. It's incredibly clear at this point, despite the game trying to portray their relationship as healthy and caring, that Adam not only has no respect for Samus, but possibly even has an unhealthy desire to see her suffer. I can seriously just think of no other explanation for this. And what's worse, Samus literally thanks him for it. Adam, thank you. Leave the rest to me. Now, just because Adam is dead now does not mean we're done talking about his relationship with Samus, but... Ugh, man, this scene just pisses me off so much. But we do need to move on. Samus follows Adam's last order to secure another survivor and stop the ship's course. Turns out the Metroid Queen is here, and since it's the original, the Metroids it produces can still be frozen. So one really frustrating boss fight later, it's dead, and the survivor Samus was sent to find turns out to be... My name is Madeline Bergman. Yes, turns out the woman we talked to earlier was actually the android body of MB, the artificial intelligence based on Mother Brain. Madeline had taken her under her wing as though she were her own daughter, even giving her the name Melissa Bergman. But once she started developing her own personality, the staff tried to detain and control her, and this betrayal broke something in her and sent her on a vendetta against humanity. After all of this exposition, Melissa herself shows up and tries to kill them, but the Federation army shows up randomly in full force and all hell breaks loose. In what seems to be a hopeless situation, Madeline shoots a freezing beam at Melissa, and the army takes the opportunity to riddle her with bullets, much to Madeline's dismay. A stuffy military guy tries to take Madeline with them, likely to eliminate her like everyone else, but surprise, the only side character we haven't actually seen a dead body for is actually alive, and goes with Samus to take Madeline safely back to Federation HQ. And before the credits roll, we see Samus give Adam a thumbs up for the first time ever. The and Okay, I've tried to keep this summary all professional and crap because this is an analysis and there are plenty of guys on the internet already who yell at bad games, but holy crap this game pisses me off! And I haven't even started interpreting the stupid thing yet! I just... <sighs> but I am here to analyze this, to figure out what the story's trying to say, and why it's such a spectacular failure at it, so... Let's go. There are a few things that we need to talk about if we're gonna try and dig into what this game means. The first we'll talk about is its themes of motherhood, because as much as they don't hit you over the head as strongly as the story of Adam and Samus, it still is a pretty big part of the game, and for that matter, definitely part of the problem too. The game makes a really big deal out of the baby Metroid from Super Metroid, and this is very intentional. It's setting Samus up as a mother figure, and for that matter, one dealing with the trauma of the death of her child, so to speak. Sakamoto was actually rather particular that the baby Metroid was only ever referred to in this game as the baby. Baby, the baby, the baby, the baby, the baby, the baby. In case that wasn't on the nose enough, Samus receives a distress signal called Baby's Cry, sent from a ship named after a container designed to give sustenance to babies, the bottle ship. Oh, and the game's nonsensical subtitle, Other M. It makes no sense on its own, but put the M before the word other, and it spells mother. The first letters of each word also spell out mom. Apparently, the completely nonsensical name was worth it for the sake of these references to the game's intended meaning. Now, of course, the ship is where these themes really crystallize. The bottle ship exists for the purpose of creating life, the creatures of the planet Zebes, and nurturing it, and raising it toward a specific purpose. And to that end, they also created an artificial intelligence unit that they also were trying to nurture toward a specific purpose, and it gained life of its own. The bottle ship is all about creating and nurturing life. But of course, as Samus points out in her closing monologue, this creation and nurturing of all these creatures was done out of human selfishness and greed. The selfish conceits of humans drove envy to violence. 
It was their distorted perceptions and greed that awoke such fury in the fledgling girl's heart. So the bottle ship, then, is an example of parenting done for the wrong reasons and in the wrong way, leading to the corruption and eventual destruction of the metaphorical children. They were meant to be nurtured, but were instead raised to serve the corrupt interests of their metaphorical parents. This example of motherhood is most vividly portrayed, of course, in the relationship between Madeline Bergman and the AI that she created. Madeline cared about this AI as more than just a tool of their bioweapon experiments, to the point where she gave her a name, Melissa, and even shared her last name with her as though she were her daughter. But ultimately, trying to be a mother figure to her was not enough to overcome the fact that Madeline created MB out of greedy and corrupt intentions. And eventually Madeline had to end it herself. Samus is, of course, dealing with the trauma of the loss of a... well, quite frankly, the baby Metroid seems like it would be more like a pet to her than a child, but yeah, we'll just go ahead and go with the game's premise on this one. So she feels some kind of motherly connection to and responsibility for the baby Metroid that gave its life to save hers. It seems like the game is trying to set up her relationship with it as a contrast to the relationship between Madeline and Melissa. Now, of course, this is dubious at best, since Samus didn't really have a nurturing role in the baby Metroid's life, but regardless, the point seems to be that in a healthy relationship, one gives of oneself, one sacrifices for the sake of the other person. That's what happened with the Metroid and Samus. But in the case of Madeline and Melissa, Madeline's intent in creating Melissa was corrupt, and that corrupted Melissa in turn to the point where Madeline had to sacrifice her. Rather than giving of herself, she gave of Melissa for the good of everyone else. The game even mentions that MB was created because the ideal relationship between Metroids and the one controlling them was a motherly one, and Samus even goes so far as to straight up say that her relationship with the baby Metroid was the ideal one. We were able to create the ideal relationship with the Metroid, one that wasn't based on dominance or control. I remember the baby hatching before my eyes when it attacked Mother Brain in order to save me. That was the result of the kind of ideal relationship they were trying to develop with MB. Other M's ideal mother-daughter relationship is one of mutual love and respect rather than one of control, which is why MB turned out the way she did. She was created and raised for the purposes of her creators, and that control ruined both her relationship with Madeline and her stability as a person. So basically, Other M is about the importance of good maternal upbringing, the importance of it for both the mother and the child. Samus is grieving the death of a child figure, we'll say, who sacrificed itself for its mother out of love. Madeline, on the other hand, created Melissa for the specific intent of pursuing her own interests. So even when Melissa began developing a personality and Madeline began developing a motherly connection to her, that, that intent, the purpose of her creation and her existence, still led to her corruption and her violence until it got to a point where Madeline had to end her child with the same violence for which she was created. It's meant as a cautionary tale of motherhood, but it really just doesn't come together. I mean, the, it technically works. The pieces are generally where they need to be, but there's not really enough time or attention given to it because it suffers from the same problem that most of this game does. Samus has basically nothing to do with it. The stuff with Melissa and Madeline is probably the most interesting part of this story in many ways, but it's almost entirely shoved into exposition over the last 20 or so minutes of the game, and it has nothing to do with Samus. It seems like the game wants to force a thematic connection between MB and the baby Metroid, but that connection never really comes together. It's as simple as, Samus is sad because of a child figure, and now all this stuff happens with a mother and a child figure that aren't related to her. The connection is there, but it's tenuous at best, and the two scenarios fail to inform each other in any meaningful ways. It's just another story that Samus is here to witness. So the game's themes of motherhood fall pretty flat, but ultimately, they're not the most important or prominent element of this story. That would be Samus' relationship with Adam and her further development as a character. And man, did this game screw that up. We've already gone through most of the issues here over the course of the summary. Ultimately, the game tries to paint this relationship as a positive one. I could see in Adam's joking manner how close he felt to me. And he knows me better than anyone else. 
I understood well that chances were slim that I would ever find anyone that understood me like Adam. But no matter how great Samus says it is, that does not change the events of the story and the actions of these characters. Adam never once shows any level of respect for Samus, never once shows any level of care for Samus, and on a regular basis harms, inhibits, and devalues her. And yet, over the course of the entire game, Samus does nothing but look up to him, respect him greatly, and obey his every command. There's already an interpretation of this game out there as an abusive relationship, with Adam as the abuser and Samus as the woman who's so emotionally dependent on him that she puts up with it and even doesn't recognize the abuse that's happening. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and link to the article that argues this in the description, because it says it better than I could anyway, it's definitely worth a read. So, I'm going to go ahead and leave this particular interpretation at that for now, but that's the sad thing about this. It's really the only way to make this story make any sense. As it stands, it's simply a terrible story that romanticizes a relationship that, upon any level of examination, is nothing short of abusive. Samus is completely submissive over the course of the entire game to a man who clearly does not have her best interests at heart, and we are supposed to believe that this is a good thing. Which brings me to the other big question surrounding this game. Is it sexist? Yes. Yes, it is. It's completely, blindingly, offensively sexist. I know that a feminist is not a popular thing to be in the gaming world right now, but I don't care. This game is so disdainful of its female characters, and its protagonist in particular, Samus Aran of all people, that you'd have to be actively blinding yourself to sexism not to see this. But that's also a very popular thing in the video game world right now, so let me try and point it out. It's true that there's nothing inherently sexist about Samus following the orders of a man. That, in and of itself, is not a problem. Similarly, Samus showing weakness is not in and of itself a problem either. We don't need perfect female characters, we need complex and engaging ones. But there are plenty of other problems where those two came from. The important bit of context here is that we're not just talking about a female protagonist in a video game. We're talking about Samus Aran, one of the most iconic and influential female characters in this entire medium. To take a character like that, and for that matter one who had been developed to some extent by previous games, and develop her in this game as someone who is entirely dependent and wholly submissive to a man, is... suspect. It's not necessarily sexist in and of itself, but it really doesn't help the game's case. But there are two major elements of this game that make it very difficult to deny or ignore its sexism. The first is that it's very intent on reminding us of Samus's femininity. Not that she shouldn't have any femininity. In fact, had this game done what literally every other Metroid game has done and put Samus in the role traditionally held by men in these games instead of making her subservient to men for the entire thing, a touch of femininity would actually have been a very interesting thing and made her character more relatable. But instead, the game focuses on nothing but her existence as a female human, and basically makes the argument that she should more fully be embodying these stereotypically feminine qualities. From the beginning, she's constantly talking about babies and exhibiting motherly instincts, and in fact, motherly instinct and feminine emotions are important elements of literally every female character in this game. All three of them. Though the sexualization of the character is actually impressively subtle by Team Ninja's standards, it's certainly there. There are two male characters who refer to Samus by feminine nicknames, and since one of them is Adam, it's hard to read it as anything but derision, despite what Samus has to say on the matter. The game even has two bathrooms in this abandoned facility, and in a move I've literally never seen a game pull with abandoned bathrooms, only the women's bathroom is accessible. I mean, I know this is a small thing, but really? In an abandoned space station, the game felt it necessary to restrict Samus to her own gender's restroom? Can you name a single game that's done that? Do you think the game would have done it if Samus were a man? What purpose does this serve aside from being there to remind us of Samus's femininity? Other M isn't just putting Samus in a position of submission, psychological weakness, and emotional dependency. It's putting her in that position while also very heavy-handedly emphasizing her gender and her femininity. It's kind of hard to ignore the correlation there. It's also worth noting that if one of Other M's strongest thematic points is on the importance of motherhood not being based on dominance or control, what does Adam's relationship to Samus say about fatherhood? 
It's said many times that he's a father figure to Samus. There's no question I saw Adam as a father figure. The closest thing to a father I had. Because apparently the Chozo that actually raised her don't count, and his relationship with her is based entirely on his authority and her submission. So then, according to Other M, motherhood is about nurturing and caring without control or domination, and fatherhood is precisely about control and domination. So not only are we sticking to outdated gender roles, our paternal role model demanded complete submission of his metaphorical daughter, put her in danger and pain, shot her in the back, and never let her have any control over her own situation. But aside from that, the biggest problem here is one of agency. In fact, that's one of the bigger obstacles to female characters in video games as a whole right now. Women are often regulated in games to either damsels in distress or supporting roles, where their only real contribution to the story is to the male lead's character arc rather than any particular arc of their own. They don't really have any agency. Samus has traditionally been an exception to this, flying in the face of such portrayals of women by fulfilling a traditionally male-dominated role, that of the science fiction action hero, and doing it so perfectly that people who aren't familiar with Metroid or with Samus herself won't even realize that she's a woman in the first place. Now, that's not a perfect blueprint for strong female characters or anything like that, but it's a good start, and Samus has always been at the center of her own choices and the events of her games. But in Other M, she is completely stripped of all of this personal agency. She does make the decision to respond to the distress signal in the first place, but immediately afterwards she completely gives up control of her own actions by agreeing to follow Adam's orders to the letter, despite the fact that he has no actual authority over her in this situation. And she never once makes a decision for herself until Adam disappears from the comms, at which point, in the absence of an authority figure telling her what to do, she goes ahead and activates her grapple beam. Then once Adam shows up again, he literally shoots her in the back to stop her from taking any level of control over the situation, and gives her one final order, which she follows until the whole situation with MB completely takes over the plot. In the end, Samus accomplishes almost none of the important plot points of this game. Adam destroys all the Metroids in Sector Zero, the Metroid Queen kills Ridley, Madeline decapacitates MB, the soldiers kill MB, Anthony shows up to convince the army dude to let them take Madeline to HQ, and Samus never even discovers the identity of the Deleter. The plot point is just dropped. The game does imply very vaguely that it was James, assuming all the stuff Samus read into the situation was accurate, but still. Basically, the only important thing she did was kill the Metroid Queen. Samus spends the entire game following someone else's orders, and when she's not, the story is taken into the hands of other characters. Even Bella Swan chose for herself to become a vampire. Even Anastasia freaking Steele chose to leave when things got bad. This game literally gives Samus Aran less agency than the women of Twilight and Fifty Shades of Freaking Grey. Sorry, spoilers, in case you actually care about spoilers for those two god-awful books. Look, the, the point is, this is completely ridiculous. Taking away the agency of one of gaming's oldest and most beloved heroines in the game that is supposed to be the definitive statement on her character is either incredibly stupid or downright despicable, and in all probability, both. And yes, Other M was specifically intended to be the definitive picture of who Samus Aran is. Sakamoto himself said that before Other M, I did not think about what kind of person Samus Aran was and how she thinks and her personality. So with Other M, I really wanted to determine and express what kind of human Samus Aran is so that we can really tell what kind of natural steps she should be taking in the future. Art is usually reflective of its creator in one way or another. Now, I'm not going to make any extreme assumptions about Yoshio Sakamoto's character here. I don't, I don't know the guy, but... It is kind of difficult to ignore the sexism built into his vision of who Samus is. And again, the issue here is not that Samus should have been a perfect, unstoppable badass with no flaws or weaknesses. That would not make for an interesting character. But you can develop a character further without treating them this poorly. The Tomb Raider reboot tried to accomplish a very similar thing, and while Lara wasn't a particularly complex character, she was absolutely depicted as the strong, dependable, and independent woman we knew her to be. That game respected its protagonist. Other M clearly does not. The result is a confused mess that doesn't understand Samus, doesn't know how to write compelling characters, and doesn't know how to tackle the themes of motherhood it aspires to. As a standalone game, well, it's really bad. But as a definitive statement on one of gaming's oldest and most beloved female protagonists, it's downright offensive. 
Seriously, screw this game. Or screw attack this game, I guess. I mean, at least that would give Samus something to do. So if you have any thoughts on the game, feel free to share them in the comments. I hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something about Metroid Other M. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider sharing it and hitting that subscribe button down there, as well as checking the description for links to Games as Lead 101 on Facebook and Twitter. You can also support the show on Patreon if you want some cool rewards. Next week, we're going to talk about whether addressing important issues in a work of art actually makes that work of art better. And next month on Literary Analysis, one of my patrons decided to request my first ever analysis of a romantic visual novel. And it's about birds. Can't say I saw that one coming. So, uh, I guess until next week. Class dismissed. <laughs>